I hope you've been enjoying talking books and stuff. Please support us on Patreon to help cover our costs. Please click on the Patreon links, or you can visit our GoFundMe page. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Hello and welcome back. And once again, this is your very favorite podcast host, the R the Podcast Guy, Dennis Rimmer. This is Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. Uh, there's crowds here, as you can hear. We are at the Bellingham Comic Con. It's in the Ferndale Events Center. It's a yearly event and one of the superstar attractions this year is an author who has a number of, we'll call them young adult books, and also a couple of movie deals or TV shows in the works, and yet I do not yet know how to pronounce her name. She's from Gig Harbor, Washington, and you are? Kendara Blake. Kendara. Yeah. How long have you been in the writing biz? Uh, let's see, my first book came out in 2010, and my first published short story was in 2007. And you're, let's, that's 10 years, that's pretty good. What is the hardest lesson you had to learn as a fledging writer looking for publication? Well, yeah, I mean, being rejected is never fun, and you go through a lot of that. I, I was uh, constantly rejected for about 10 years before I finally started selling short stories. So, yeah, thick skin. Thick skin, that's good advice, because like anything else, you got to keep knocking on the door until finally the door falls down or your knuckles wear out. So tell us about, I don't know anything about your work. Kendara, Blake, what do you write? Where can we get them? Why should I read them? Okay, so I write actually in a number of different uh, genres. I have a horror series called Anna Dressed in Blood. I have a Greek mythology series called the Goddess War Trilogy. And my current series, well, actually, it just finished up in September. It's a four-book series called Three Dark Crowns. It's a dark fantasy about a matriarchal island where a queen rules, and in every generation, the queen gives birth to baby triplet girls. Each has a different magical gift, and unfortunately for them, when they turn 16, they have to murder the crap out of each other to find out who gets to be the next queen and continue the tradition. So it's sort of like the Hunger Games meet Wonder Woman. Kind of like, I would say more like Game of Thrones. <laughs> of course. What, did you watch Game of Thrones, by the way? Oh yeah, I love Game of Thrones. I haven't watched any yet. I have half an episode we watched once, and I couldn't figure out which house was which and where they were, and I lost the internet. Well, that's because I'm 70 years old and have no <laughs> clue what's going on. Uh, when you're a kid, uh, you grew up where? What area of the state? Oh, I'm from Minnesota, actually. Oh, from Minnesota. Yeah, I've only been in the Washington. I moved to Washington in 2010. So. Okay, well, 10 years. So I used to live in Bellingham. Um, when you're a kid, what did you read? What did you like to write? Did you write right off the bat, or did you come to writing later in life? Um, well, I really liked any school assignment that would let me write, you know, essays were always good and I, those were really enjoyable. Um, I didn't, when I was in seventh grade, I tried to write a novel by hand in a spiral bound notebook. So that was like my first fledgling attempt into writing something of my own. But I was always a reader. I read tons, I, I read tons of picture books. Unicorns were my drug of choice back in those days. Um, and then I jumped straight from unicorns to like Stephen King. So. Yeah. Just overnight. Basically, yeah. I, I As soon as I stopped reading The Black Stallion, I think I picked up Stephen King's Gerald's Game in fifth grade and never looked back. And we call it uh, grade five and grade seven north of the border, <laughs> but that's okay. So what was the first thing you sent out for hoping to get publication? Can you remember back then? Um, oh, the, like the very first story that I sent out hoping to get it? No, I do not remember. It was such a long time ago. I know it was not worthy of publication. <laughs> I know that for sure. And uh, yeah, it wasn't until I was on my master's degree in London that whatever happened happened. I, it started to click and I started to sell things. So with short stories now, were they in magazines or anthologies? or? I have several short stories and several anthologies. Um, a lot of horror anthologies. I also wrote uh, an X-Files story for the X-Files anthology. Um, yeah, for the 
most part. Some of them were online only. Like my very first sales were online only, and one appeared in like a prize anthology. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's how you get started. Do you have a, a regular writing routine? I do when I'm on deadline. <laughs> Yeah, uh, left to my own devices, I like to take it slow. Um, right now my writing schedule is three days a week and I shoot for a thousand words a day and that's very, very slow, it depends on the book. The next book that I'll work on, I'll bump that goal up to 2,500 words a day, but I'm still aiming to just do three days a week, I need to recharge. Right, and there's other people who do it uh, seven days a week nonstop. A friend of mine, when he writes, he says he sits down nine to five, has a lunch break, but I can't do that. I can, if I'm lucky, I do a sentence a day. No, if I, I'll do that 95 thing, or more accurately, I'll do like a noon to eight thing if I have to. If I'm on deadline, sometimes it's seven days a week. This is Kendara Blake. We're discussing books and writing and stuff with her here on Talking Books. And we're at the Bellingham uh, Comic Con. It's in the Ferndale Event Center. It's an annual event. Uh, how did you hear about it, Kendara? Well, Eric, the show organizer, has been kind enough to invite me for the last couple of years, and it's just never worked out. This is usually my busy time. I release books in September, and sometimes I'm on tour still up until this part of the year. But this year, my book released a little earlier, so I went on the road a little earlier, and the time worked out, so I was able to come. That's great. Uh, are you planning to come next year, or is that too far ahead? That's probably too far ahead. <laughs> But the show has been amazing, you know. It's, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I've never been up here. Right. But it's really cool. Good. So you're having some success today. Uh, run down for us again your publications, please. So my first series is Anna Dressed in Blood. My second series is the Goddess War Trilogy, starting with Anti-Goddess, Anti-Goddess, Mortal Gods, and Ungodly. And my most recent series is Three Dark Crowns. So Three Dark Crowns, One Dark Throne, Two Dark Reigns, and Five Dark Fates. And I know they're numbered out of order, and I apologize for that. <laughs> you have a website, I assume? Yep, KendaraBlake.com. And that's K-E-N-D-A-R-E-B-L-A-K-E.com. So it looks like Kendar, but it isn't. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Back again. Here we are still at the Comic Con in Bellingham. Actually, it's in Ferndale, Washington, which is basically halfway between the greater Vancouver area and the greater Seattle area. So here we are again with talking books and writing and stuff. So we're talking about books and writing and stuff with, we'll start with, obviously, your Wonder Woman. Yes, I am. I can go by Diana as well. That's Queen. Queen. Oh, she a princess queen. Princess of the mascara for now. For now. Oh, okay. <laughs> My mother's the queen. Oh, they always are, aren't they? <laughs> How do you come up with this? Why? Why are you in a Wonder Woman suit? Well, I have to protect people from Ares. Huh? He is, you know, the god of war. Just trying to keep people safe out here. Well, you're probably the best looking Wonder Woman I've seen today. So, how long does it take you to put on your suit? <laughs> 30 40 minutes for everything getting a little bit better about it now and you made it all yourself um, parts of it but some of it was uh, commissioned and stuff like that we're at the Bellingham Comic Con uh, this is talking books and writing and stuff uh, this was Wonder Woman and what uh, attracted you to that character I just really like how powerful she is and how she's kind of in things for the people and not just her. She's not very self-centered. So you've obviously seen the movie. Oh yes, oh, yeah. quite a few times. <laughs> quite a few times. And also we have a red-haired, well you're not a god, or are you a goddess? Yeah, there we go. Okay, we, you are? <laughs> I'm Queen Mira of Atlantis. <laughs> she's only a princess and you're a queen. How'd that happen? Oh, uh, sometimes. I mean, she'll be a queen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> And that's an Aquaman type character? Yeah, uh, actually she ends up uh, marrying Aquaman. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> well, it's been, the movie's been out for a year in the comics for now, like 30 like, years. At I hope least. people know this by now. <laughs> oh, oh, do they? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh well, time to read more comics. I always thought there was something fishy with that guy. But, <laughs> <laughs> so what attracted you to that character? Um, I mean, it was more the same thing. Of it, It's just like a powerful female character, and, and she was one that she's not the main character, but she she can stand alone by herself independently, um, and it's nice to, to see that, and especially seeing a lot of little kids here and encourage a, a strong female role model. So what kind of reaction are you having today? Right now I'm tired, um, <laughs> but the, a lot of the little kids are extremely happy. We've had a lot of kids run up and 
ask if we're real <laughs> and give us hugs uh, when we had Batman here with us. Great. Right. Batman! And it's, it's been a really good experience. Is this your first year here? Here, yes. I've done uh, Rose City Comic Con and Emerald City Comic Con several years. Okay, and how about you? Same here? This is, that was Murma? Mira. Mira, Queen of the Undersea. And Wonder Woman, is this your first year here? Uh, Bellingham, yes. And uh, just like my pal over here, I've done quite a few down in the Seattle Portland area as well. Great. Well, thank you two very much. Yep. And this is Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. And we'll continue in a moment. Continuing now here at the Bellingham Comic Con. It's in Ferndale, Washington, about halfway more or less between Greater Vancouver and Greater Seattle. It's a yearly event, and with us right now is Matt Youngmark. Matt, you've got books in your hands. Tell me about them. Uh, so choose a books. They're, uh, they're a line of choose-your-own-ending books, similar to the old-school uh, choose-your-own-adventure series from the 80s and 90s, uh, written a little more PG-13. Um, so, like, language is ass crap and damn. There's no sex at all. But, like, some adult situations, like, <laughs> you can choose to keep drinking until you pass out. Oh. Spoiler alert, not the way to find the good endings. <laughs> uh, they're novel length. Yeah. So the first one is a Zombocalypse Now. It has 112 possible endings. It is a zombie story, so only seven in which you don't die. Oh, okay. Like, pretty good odds for a pretty zombie apocalypse. Odd. Yeah. All right. And what else do we have here? Uh, this the, is Matt Youngmark, by the way. Uh, the second book is called Thrusts of Justice. It's a superhero story. Okay. You get one, with the first choice you make, you get one of three different superpowers. You can either try to save the world or go villain, crush it under your heel. Justice isn't right for everyone. You know, we're not going to judge. That one has a nine happy endings out of 90, so fully a 10% survival rate. 10%. <laughs> and it's written like it's... Okay, so the first book I wrote was the zombie one, and it's super fun and super funny. The plot is all over the place, like I'm not going to lie. But I learned a lot, right, about the structure and the formatting and everything. So the second one holds together more as like one big story. So like it's a mystery, there's a big doomsday plot. And every time you do make a poor decision and die horribly, like you will, you're likely to find like a little a little hint, of a little secret about what's going on behind the scenes so you can make a better choice next time. And then, you know, again, die horribly because it's only a 10% survival rate. But if you keep reading it, you know, you, you, know, you kind of uncover different parts of the plot and, like, you know, it feels like you're reading a novel in a kind of random order depending on which choices you make and which parts of it you see first. Um, the third book is Time Travel Dinosaur. And that one is probably the most ambitious of the three because every time you make a decision in this book, you alter the timeline. So it's a different version of you that goes to the 1800s that sets up things that will happen later in the 2200s. But you might get the payoff first before you read the setup depending on what order you take them in. But again, the more you read it, the more you see all the different timelines kind of fit together into one big story. So yeah, they're really, really fun. Really fun. That's Matt Young, Mark. I cut him off there. Uh, what uh, sort of inspired you to come up with this kind of a format? So the uh, the first book came out, oh, I want to say like 10 years ago. Um, and I was reading uh, Dinosaur Comics, which is a web comic by Ryan North. And um, they had a, a, a bit about Choose Your Own Adventure books in there, which, of course, I loved. When I, I learned to read on those kind of books. I loved them because they were written for little kids, but they would just kill you over and over again. <laughs> the spirit I wanted to keep very much alive. So, like, but but he was like, oh, my God, Choose Your Own Adventure books. I love those. I have to write one. And I thought I was going to write one for, for, like, younger kids, and it was going to be 80 pages, and I was going to write it in about two weeks. A year later, I had some Apocalypse <laughs> Now. It's 300 pages. Um, you know, it's... It, it, it spiraled a little bit, right. but I was so thrilled with it, and it turned out really well, and it sold really well, actually. So I uh, continued the series. I've got three out now, and uh, they're a lot of fun. Now, are you self-published, or...? I am, yeah. I publish myself. I um, I have a... I used to be in newspaper publishing, and so I have uh, a lot of the skill set necessary to, like, you know, to take the whole... You know, I do the illustrations myself. I write them, and I, I do all the graphic design. So I've got... You know, I love publishing. It's already in my, in my blood. So, yeah, I didn't even offer these to a publisher because I thought, how do I explain choose your own adventure books, novel length, PG-13, you know what, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. Might as well, and that seems to be the way to go these days. Uh, Matt Young Mark, I'll get the name right yet, has been our guest here, and you can look him up. I assume you have a website. But I do, it's youngmark.com. Youngmark.com. Yep, That's just like it sounds. Yep, or find me on Twitter at, Ma at Matt Youngmark. At Matt Youngmark. Matt, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Continuing our walkabout here at the Bellingham Comic Con in the Ferndale Convention Center, which is just north of Bellingham, but uh, probably halfway between Greater Seattle and Greater Vancouver. And I am pleased to introduce 
two people who I have no clue as to who they are. <laughs> you are? Celestia Lutenberg. Is that from Harry Potter? No, it's from Danganronpa. It's a video game. Okay, and you are? Kaiji, your neighborhood friendly police officer. From the same video game or something different? Something different. Tell me about it. It's a game called Your Turn to Die, a mobile game. It's pretty fun. How'd you get into this character persona? Uh, I just really liked him and I just put on a tuxedo vest and then put on a wig. And there you go. That's not your hair? Nope. Oh. I can just yoink. Oh, okay. Well, I need one. Oh, it already happened. <laughs> and tell me about your character and where, where it came from. Um, so Danganronpa is like, um, well, like I said, it's a video game, but it's mainly factored around like murder and stuff. My character is actually dead. So <laughs> um, I got like into my character because she's really pretty and like really interesting. So I just really like her. How long did it take to design the outfit? I bought most of it, but oh. it took three days to style the wig. And it's all curly cue and everything like that. So yeah, yeah three days with those big old fashioned rollers. Mm -hmm. You're not used to that, I think. No, I'm not. This is my first time styling a wig, actually. Oh. Well, it did a good job. Once again, you are? Uh, Kaiji. And you are? Celestia Ludenberg. And your video game is? Danganronpa. And yours is? Your turn to die. My turn to get out of here and go somewhere else. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank welcome. you, too. Continuing with our discussion with people here at the Bellingham Comic Con. It's in Ferndale, Washington, about halfway more or less between Greater Vancouver and Greater Seattle. The host, the organizer, the man behind the method, behind the machine, behind the mastery of this event, Eric Burris. How long have you been doing this? How long? Uh, this is the 11th year. And apparently on your website, it's the first year, not too many people, and then all of a sudden it took off. No, it's, it's gradually grown. Huh. Yeah, yeah, it's gradually grown over the years. Um, a lot of it has been um, probably, I think, uh, due to social media. It's probably because that it's just it, it, there's so much exposure, and we actually get a lot of we get a lot of support from the comic community themselves. Those shops love the show, and the vendors they they tell people about it. So you know, it's it's been a lot of word of mouth and uh, and social media, and it just every year it just gets more and more and bigger and bigger. It's at the Ferndale Event Center. Uh, how did you come across selecting this place uh, if it's called the Bellingham Comic Con? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first show was actually in Bellingham. It was in a little uh, building. There's a, a hotel in Bellingham by the airport, and uh, at the time it was called the Hampton Inn. Uh, it's, it's a different chain now, but there was a, uh, a detached little uh, meeting hall to that and it was 3,700 square feet. And so uh, we went ahead and decided to do the show. Um, I always, I had volunteered at bigger shows myself. Um, more of the old fashioned comic book shows, not the big corporate mega shows. You know, the, guy, the ones that are run by one guy, like me. <laughs> and I volunteered to help them and became really good friends with them and and when i moved up here i uh i thought bellingham would be a great place for a show so i i talked to some of the guys i knew because i i was a vendor myself for a long time i knew a lot of these guys and i said what do you think about doing a show up in bellingham and they go you know we'll give it a shot we'll do it we'll try it so we uh we did that show and um we only had about 250 people we had some great guests. Um, hadn't planned on having guests, but a friend of mine had been working on Spider-Man for a long time. And I, I called up Randy in Portland. I go, Randy, I want to do a comic con up in Bell, and I'd like to be my guest. They go, sure. Yeah, and then somebody says, hey, I know a guy. And some other guy goes, I know a guy. And I ended up with a whole bunch of guests. And we sold out of the show. And uh, like I said, there was only about 250 people. But everybody was, there was a buzz in the room where everybody's going, this is kind of cool. It's fun. So we thought, let's, we, obviously, you know, we could promote and become a little bigger show. And at the, that point, this building had just been uh, purchased by somebody. This is originally an old bingo hall, apparently. Huh? And somebody came in and they wanted to make it an event center. So they came and remodeled it. And I'm not sure how I, I uh, 
found out about it. Um, could have been the internet, but there was a lot of people in Bellingham that didn't know there was an event center here. Because uh, people are going, hey, we need to find a bigger place. And I go, where is there? And they go, I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> and then when I told people about the Ferndale Event Center, they go, what's that? You know. So it was all new. And uh, I really thought the place was too big for the show. And I thought we'd grow into it. But we, we I didn't want to move the show multiple times. So I thought, well, we'll go here and we'll just build the show. And then, you know. But the first show we had here sold out. And, you know, the table sold out. And then every year the tables sell out. And every year the attendance rises a little bit. And we have just the right a mix of something for everybody here. And this is Talking Books and Writing and Stuff, talking with Eric Burris, uh, organizer of the Bellingham Comic Con. I assume there's going to be one next year, Eric? Yep. Well, actually, yes, there'll be one in April. It's going to be a, a slightly different show. I've done a couple variations of this show. Uh, we did a couple toy shows that were Legos and toys. Um, next year in April, we'll do a spring show, and we're going to make it just a... a kind of a market, it's called Bellingham Comic Con Marketplace, and uh, we're not going to do the events, and we're not going to have the, the guests come into town for it, it's going to be all local people, it's going to be comic shop owners, and, and local artists, and comic book collectors, who also buy and sell comics to sort of collect, you know, sort of finance their hobby, and right. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it'll be just a, a big old fun thing, and you know, we'll we'll still do the thing where we let kids in uh, seven and under for free, and we'll just drop the admission to five bucks, and just come in and buy and sell and trade and have fun. So when you talk about local, you're talking about from Vancouver to Seattle, or well, it's it really is um, some of our what our local artists are is probably as far south as Tacoma, but they're guys that do all the local shows, and they do this show. It's kind of a circuit for them, but um, they they have a great following. Most of them are here every year. Um, oftentimes, there's more artists, and this is, this is part of the reason to do another show, is oftentimes not everybody can get into the show, because there's not enough space for everybody that wants to set up. And so I thought if I do a show and just make it all local people, you know, artists and writers and, and comic and toy people, then we can get more people. Those people that there's people that normally set up at this show that didn't get into this show because it sold out so fast. And so there's some there were some great, great people uh, that I would love to see here that it's an annual thing to see them. And it's like Tables went so fast <laughs> because of word of mouth. Yeah. You know. So I want those guys to be able to come back and it's like I want to do another show. I'm gonna make sure that you get in because you're a staple at my show. And it's sort of like a victim of your own success. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. We ran out of wristbands today. That was really awkward. <laughs> uh, any cross-border traffic? You're getting some action north of the border? We uh, we get some. When I first started the show, we got a lot more. And what's happened over the last 10 years is somebody, another promoter has started doing shows in Vancouver. And uh, their dollar in Canada seems to be weaker. Um, you know, they can go to a show there and get a lot more for their money. Uh, they don't have to hassle with the border. Um, I send a lot of free passes up to Canada. Uh, I send advertising to the retailers, and I, I throw in free passes for their customers. And you know, it's like I know it's a hassle to come down across the border, and you know, come down and don't worry about you know. Um, it's like the the next show I do. It's only going to be five bucks to get in, so I don't care if it's American or Canadian currency. It's not enough for me to even. Worry about, worry about, right. yeah. So, <laughs> so this is Eric Burris with the uh, Bellingham Comic Con. Uh, it's an annual event. We've got an event coming up in April. Probably another one of these next fall. I'm just guessing. How do we people find you on the web? Uh, well, you know, the website we have is is pretty basic. Uh, it's it's very fundamental. We don't use it except for just basic information. Uh, the Facebook page is really interactive. Uh, we cross-promote a lot of events that go on at local stores. Um, we throw in some comic book humor um, and keep people up on just what's going on with this show. And of course, we, we cross-promote other similar events, you know, because advertising the old-fashioned way is so expensive where you buy ads or radio time or whatever. And it's like, hey, I'm doing a show. I'll, I'll put out flyers or advertise your show on my Facebook page and you advertise my show on your Facebook page. And it's, it's all a win-win. 
you know. Exactly. Uh, how do we track you down on Facebook? Is it easy? It's uh, yeah, just Bellingham Comic Con. Bellingham Comic Con on Facebook. Eric has been our guest, Eric Burris, the organizer. Thanks for your time, Eric. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And yes, this is Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh, oh.